Уважаемые участники конференции. Where people of different faiths, different political views, representatives of, vari of various countries and continents are united by our concern for the fate of humanity. We can see before our very eyes the destruction of the very foundations of human existence, namely the world economy. In order for the world economy to function successfully, certain postulates must be observed. First, money in the world should be an equivalent of exchange of goods and ensure movement of values for the relations between countries. Secondly, the world financial system should, on the basis of how the world's money functions, service various types of relations among countries. That's the movements of capital, investment, loans, subsidies, foreign trade and goods and services and so forth. These relations should promote, first of all, the modernization of existing and creation of new productive capacities. Third, the world banking system should promote the effective use of credit resources the development of production in each country. Fourth, world trade should promote an effective, efficient world division of labor and mutually beneficial exchange of goods between countries. The catastrophic deepening of the world crisis uh, is linked with the distortion of these fundamental functions in all categories. First of all, since 1944, the U.S. dollar began to serve as the world currency. From 1971, it lost its backing by real products or, or even gold and ceased to be a real measure of value of goods and services. The printing of dollars is fully in the hands of the Fed, which is a private organization and is, has no, the world community has no control over it. As a result, you have these dollar pyramids, which inevitably collapse, pulling the world economy down with them. Second, we now have the world financial system, which has led to a huge market in fictitious uh, capacities. Um, you have multi-billion dollar flows, which determine the rise and fall of prices on the markets, and this can destroy not only entire industries, but entire countries. Then you have financial war launched against countries that, and governments that don't, don't go, alone, uh, go along. You have offshore zones in which trillions of dollars of capital from different countries has gone for tax evasion purposes, providing the national economies of sources of growth. Lending by the IMF is done with strict conditionalities and simply puts them deeper in debt. Third, the world banking system has turned into one big criminal corporation, which drains the blood out of the real sector of the economy, paralyzing the activity of governments, robbing the populations of countries in the name of super capitals for those who own bank capital. Banking and commercial secret has become a bastion of the defense of such activities. Uh, there are, it's regularly payment of uh, astronomical bonuses, no control over banking activity, quadrillions of dollars of derivatives are uh, like a boa constrictor on the world economy, leading it to collapse. Finally, we have the existing system of world trade, which is called free trade, liberalization. In fact, all it does is uh, uh, open up the markets of countries of the second and third world to be grabbed by transnational corporations, their raw materials seized, 
uh, by the leading countries, and this leads to the bankruptcy of national economies and the growth of social problems. The destruction of the foundations of the world economy inevitably leads to a crisis thereof, to chaos, to instability, wars, epidemics, catastrophes, massive mass deaths of the population, liquidation of national economies and national sovereignty. The destruction, annihilation of national economies is an inevitable part of the process of globalization uh, to establish a new global world order. The mechanisms are the IMF, the WTO, the World Bank, and the EBRD. A dramatic example is Ukraine. I'm going to show you this catastrophe in figures, everything that happened in the past 20 years. Six months after proclamation of independence, what happened on June 3, 1992, is that uh, Ukraine joined the IMF and began to borrow, accepting the conditionalities. In 1995, uh, Lyndon LaRouche came to Ukraine on our invitation, and as did Helga Zepp LaRouche and other uh, representatives of the Schiller Institute, Michael Fitt and Dennis Small came later. LaRouche met the uh, speaker of the Ukrainian parliament, Alexander Maros. He met members of the parliament from the Socialist Party. With, he met with scientists, uh, economists, and he told them what you should do and what you should not do, and what reforms you ought to be making if you actually want a, a renaissance of your economy or recovery. LaRouche exudes love for humanity, whereas the IMF, the IMF, however, came in with dollars and bought off polit politicians, officials, members of parliament. And therefore, instead of listening to LaRouche, Ukraine started doing everything the IMF told them to do. Uh, deregulation, privatization, so-called macroeconomic stabilization, what is, what is deregulation? Uh, f uh, f floating currency rate. All the, the um, uh, state-owned ba and commercial banks were uh, cut loose to fend for themselves. And then there was privatization, putting on the auction block for peanuts uh, the uh, really the whole economy, the the agricultural collective farms, the industry, and so forth. On macroeconomic terms, Ukraine went to a cheap labor model, reduction of uh, social benefits, and elimination of subsidies for housing and utilities. In 2008, Ukraine joined the WTO and began. And the results were similar, starting with the destruction of material production, physical production in Ukraine. We can see in graph one how the GDP since 1991 to 2012, in, in that two decades, how the GDP changed and how um, uh, physical output changed. I'll say something about GDP in a minute, but look at the second column, which is electricity production. It uh, fell by 35%. Produ production of rolled steel uh, fell by more than a half. In 2012, tractor production was only five-some percent of what it had been in 1990. 
this is in a country where one third of the population lives in rural areas and which has 20% of the earth's uh, black the world's black earth soils and Ukraine had 16 major machine tool plants this is looking at the right hand column which produced 37,000 machine tools in 1990 and now there are only three of them left which are barely uh, on their feet and they produce 40 machine tools a year So we had 50,000 companies privatized, and 49% of them have basically ceased to exist. They shut down. Uh, Ukraine was previously uh, one of the leading countries in the world in per capita GDP. We were 11% higher than the world average per capita GDP. But our GDP fell by one third. And in, uh, by 2012 was only two thirds of the, um, 20, uh, the 1990 level. Per capita, we are 40% below the av world average. We're lower than Namibia. And so that's what we had with uh, physical output. Now, the basis for um, uh, growth in the Ukrainian uh, economy is science. We were always proud uh, of Soviet and sci uh, Ukrainian science in particular. We were seventh in the world on the strength of our scientific complex. But what we see here is the destruction of Ukrainian science. This is what happened to Ukrainian science over the last 20 years. We had... Um, uh, 50,000 people working in science and 500,000 people. The, the most talented of them left the country. Hundreds of thousands of scientists were thrown out on the street to sell stuff. Uh, hundreds of thousands of young people who should have become scientists did not. <coughs> There you're seeing the cut by 50% of the uh, people working in the National Academy of Sciences system. The second bar is the number of sciences overall. It's at a, just over a third of what it was. Then people employed in innovation, innovative industries is at about 30% of the previous level. Research in the technological sciences, 28% of what it was. And the number of industry-related uh, uh, research institutes is uh, only 9.5% of what it was previously. And then this is the uh, putting into action of new technologies. Only This is occurring at a rate of only 7.6% of the rate it was happening in 1990. We should note that this kind of destruction of uh, science uh, means that, that only the, the rate of companies um, engaging in innovative research uh, is only 20% of what it was. This is a scandal, a shame for, uh, for Ukraine. The, uh, the um, uh, portion of uh, uh, GDP growth thanks to new technologies is only 0.7% in Ukraine 
as against 60 to 90 percent in other countries. During the years of its independence, Ukraine has lost 12 million jobs. The ILO um, says that our unemployment is around 10 percent, but uh, but this doesn't show the whole picture. This is just the tip of the iceberg. It's actually much higher. What Ukraine did obtain during these years is foreign debt. When the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, we now have a foreign debt which is double the golden currency reserves of the country. And our net, uh, our gross foreign debt is approaching 80% of GDP. The worst thing is that this collapse of the economy has impoverished this, the population. The minimum wage in Ukraine is 118 euros per month. The minimum pension is 86 euros per month. But we don't live in Africa. We, ha we have a pretty cold climate. You have to heat your house. You have to wear some clothes. And these are absolutely intolerable uh, uh, no levels for Central Europe. These, these are these levels are only one-third of what is required for subsistence. The low level set for the minimum uh, wages leads to the direct deaths of the population and the degradation of our natural resources. Wages in uh, the, the port, uh, share of wages in value creation averages only 6.3% in Ukraine as against 40% in the EU. 80% of the population lives below the poverty line. We have increased drug addiction, increased uh, alcohol consumption, super exploitation of uh, workers. Uh, psychological effects, crime, the, the environment. These are the conditions leading to a reduced uh, quality of life for the majority of the Ukrainian population. Our average life expectancy or average life uh, duration has dropped from 71 to 68.8 uh, years over the last 15 years. This is below the average European level. Men uh, live to be only 62. And yet uh, Ukraine followed IMF demands for pension reform, uh, raising the pension age for women to 50, uh, from 55 to 60 and for men as high as 62. And so here you see um, changes in the population. This is... This is what LaRouche was talking about with regard to directed, uh, deliberate genocide. In 1990, we had uh, 52.1 million people in Ukraine. Now, nominally, we have 45.6 million in 2012. But... In, uh, in addition, 7 million left and are living abroad for economic reasons, so they're not in Ukraine. They went to Russia to get work. They couldn't get work in Ukraine. And this is why Ukraine today leads the world in juvenile drug addiction and alcoholism. So we had 52 million people. Nominally, we have 45.6. In reality, we have 39 million people. 
during the Great Patriotic War, World War II, Ukraine lost five and a half million people killed and two million taken to forced labor in Germany. We lost seven and a half million people during the war, but during these 20 years of reform, we have lost uh, six and a half million dead and seven million departed, almost 14 million people, thus nearly twice the number of losses during the war. In the white segment is an extrapolation of what the population of Ukraine would have been if there hadn't been this massive destruction. We had a little, if we'd had a little bit of uh, slow growth such as we had, and full employment, and free education, and free medicine, health care. Our population would by now be 56 uh, and a half um, percent, a million, almost 60 million, almost 57 million. This is a crime. As a result, Ukraine, like other countries of the world, has a pre approached the dangerous boundary of a total collapse of the economy, social explosion, permanent political coups, loss of sovereignty, chaos, and the threat of civil war. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, in February of this year, He says, we can talk about the group of seven or the group of eight or the group of 20, but really it's all a group of zero, a big nothing. I agree with that. The leading countries of the world have shown themselves totally incapable of proposing uh, prescriptions to save humanity. And we see the shuttering of the world economy and we see the misanthropic nature of the British economic model and the uh, inability of leading countries to protect humanity from the deaths of billions. So what must humanity do? Not rely on the humanism and altruism of the leading country, capitalist countries, but look for local uh, alliances, regional integration, this, um, this attempt uh, is uh, driving the monstrous debt crisis, is, is being driven by the uh, debt crisis of the leading economies, the EU and USA. Uh, there's no alternative to an integration approach in the world economy uh, today. We need... Um, only, only economic clusters with populations of 250, 300 million people can survive under current conditions. If you have regional uh, alliances, you can stim have incentives for the domestic markets, uh, increase your own production, carry out modernization, shift to technologies of the new set that's coming on, ensure stable growth of employment, um, improve the quality of uh, life and uh, life expectancy. We had the speech by Dr. Galoni, who had a very excellent pr prospect perspective for regional integration uh, in Europe. There were uh, participants in from Argentina who had this kind of an idea. This matches the idea of countries uniting their efforts in the way that LaRouche has proposed. The more regional integration we have, the more we can protect countries against the flaws of the uh, economic basic system today. And so then we need global reforms and put the four categories I mentioned at the outset into a more normal alignment. 
We need regional currencies uh, that are backed up by real production. We need uh, sovereignty in currency policy. We need currency controls. Uh, we need money to be printed only when it advances real economic growth. Second, we need regional financial system, uh, which will take cooperation among countries to a new qualitative uh, level of mutual assistance. We need our own sources of money supply and so-called long money uh, the current markets are absolutely unacceptable. They are not an acceptable institute of investment, uh, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, etc. These need to be liquidated in favor of our own rating agencies um, to evaluate, the, uh, on a, uh, make a real evaluation of credit risk. We need to liquidate hedge funds and offshore zones. We need tax policies which will uh, promote the integration of the economies, uh, job creation in the real sector, um, and so forth. Third, we must reform the banking system in order to have banking separation on the Glass-Steagall model in order to be able to write off the speculative capital and create powerful uh, credit resources for long-term investment uh, in capital-intensive infrastructure projects. We need to replace banking, sec uh, to uh, get rid of banking secrecy and have uh, full transparency of the activity of the National Bank of each country, and we need um, uh, countries to unite their efforts to exercise oversight over the central bank um, of, a regional, of regional alliances. And we need regional development banks for uh, financing large-scale um, cooperative projects. Fourth, we must remember what Hamilton said, we need protectionism. Hamilton said we, Hamilton said, national banking system and protectionism in trade. This is how we protect the uh, domestic market of any region where uh, we allow deregulation of the trades of, of the um, uh, uh, international, regional, interregional trade only if it promotes the development of each country's industry and infrastructure. And thus, we must have a new quality of international economic cooperation as an alternative to free trade, respecting national sovereignty. This can be done if we strengthen the role of the state in the economy. We had a discussion yesterday about weak governments. When you have a weak government, Having uh, weak governments of individual countries is the dream of the Queen of England and her manager, Barack Obama. What they like is to have weak governments of countries. But if we, we do these reforms for modernization of production and introducing technologies of the new phase, this requires strong government action. Mr. Kotagawa called this a war, and you have to win wars. Can you imagine some sniveling, if you, some, some sniveling no good like, say, Gorbachev, could he have, could he have won World War II? Only the strong Soviet government uh, ensured the turning point in World War II and saved humanity from fascism. This is what means a strong leader. This is a, what is meant by a strong, strong leadership and a strong government. <laughs> this is how I see our uh, approaches to radical changes in the world economy through regional integration. <laughs> Lastly, I'd like to talk about Ukraine's prospects in the Eurasian Union, which for us is a un unique 
and uh, only chance to save the country. To join the customs union with Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, and the new Eurasian Union, this this was an objective necessity for the leaders of those three countries to form that common market uh, and unite their uh, productive ca uh, capability capacities. If If this is not done, then the global struggle for grabbing resources will shift from the Near East to the Far East and affect all of Eurasia. We, this is an area where we are united by a common culture. Integration with Russia is the way, is the way out for uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan. Belarus acted in this direction organically, while Ukraine, for all these years of its so-called independence, has been uh, uh, being run by Washington and Brussels, and this pre prevents the uh, Ukrainian government and politicians from adopting the integration uh, a decision which is the only one that makes any sense, either from an economic or a civilizational standpoint, and that is to join the uh, customs union and the unified eco single economic space of Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Rather, the, U the Ukrainian uh, authorities instead have uh, announced the policy of Euro integration uh, entering a free trade zone with the EU and joining NATO. For Ukraine, for our economy, science, culture, and political stability, this is a dead-end and ruinous uh, pathway. Uh, research done by the uh, Institute of National Forecasting of Ukraine have shown that a free trade zone with the EU will cause losses, GDP losses, uh, to Ukraine as uh, our domestic production is driven out of the market. Our energy cost per unit of GDP is quadruple what the EU has and we'll, our companies will just go bankrupt under these conditions. And Ukraine uh, will get more problems from the EU, from being in the EU, than Cyprus, Greece, Spain, Italy, or Portugal have. Whereas if Ukraine joins the uh, Eurasian Customs Union, uh, it will uh, achieve a uh, one and a half to, from one and a half to six percent increase of GDP. That's what President Putin told President Yanukovych uh, last month. The same in the Russian uh, Academy's Institute for National Economic Forecasting uh, has projected that if Ukraine joins the custom union, they will gain seven billion, the Ukrainian economy will gain seven billion uh, annually and uh, have a 60% increase in exports. We can we could analyze if I had time sector by sector the advantages that will accrue to Ukraine from joining the uh, the Eurasian Trade uh, Customs Union. Calculations were done by the Committee on Questions of Economic Cooperation between Ukraine and Russia. They analyzed both the direct impact and the mediated indirect impact from such cooperation. And both scenarios, all the scenarios showed that uh, industrial output would increase, GDP uh, would increase, 
And in the second scenario, with even just the indirect, the indirect included, it would increase even more. And above all, what would increase is machine building, which is the, has always been the core of Ukraine's GDP. The Earlier, 30, 31% of our GDP was uh, industrial machine building. And if we integrate with Russia and the others, it means we have an or, uh, a resumption of orders for our industry. In 2011, there was a conference on prospects for Eurasian integration of, of Ukraine, at which Sergei Glazyev then uh, Secretary of the Customs Union spoke, and he said that Ukraine's um, aspiration to, to join the EU will cause serious losses in GDP growth, deterioration of the structure of the economy, and it will make Ukraine a reservoir of cheap labor losing its economic sovereignty, whereas, said Glazyev, if Ukraine joins the uh, Eurasian economic space, this will be macroeconomically beneficial, uh, add $200 billion to GDP over the next 10 years, make the Ukrainian economy more uh, uh, competitive. Um, and uh, joining, uh, he's, uh, Glazyev said that joining the customs union um, does not uh, injure the sovereignty of any of its members, end of quote. And I want to emphasize that uh, um, if Ukraine joins the custom union and the Eurasian Union, it will give it access to enormous investment resources for creating large infrastructure projects. And there's no other pathway uh, available to us. And um, integration of Ukraine into the Eurasian Union created by Russia and the other post-Soviet countries is the only possibility for Ukraine to preserve its statehood, to have a, 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 an upsurge of the national economy to a new qualitative level and uh, to make its civilizational choice, protect the country from destabilization, a Nazi coup, and civil war. Yesterday, we were discussing the, yesterday at the, in the discussion period, we were talking about love how to understand love, love for your family, love for uh, your country, love for the planet. Aggression is evil. Hunger is evil. Dollar pyramids, financial speculation, the dictatorship of the British Empire. This is evil, and we have to defend uh, love uh, with, use love to defend against this evil. And therefore, I wish all of us success in this noble task uh, of cause of defending love and that we all of us, that all of us, <laughs> and I wish to Lyndon LaRouche still many more years and, and to Helga of working with love for humanity for these solutions.